Hello, everybody. My name is Bill Jones. I'm the Washington Bureau Chief for Executive Intelligence Review. Uh, today is May 30th, and we'll be talking with Helga Zepp LaRouche. Hello, Helga. Hello. Yes, let's start with uh, this trip that you finished to China. You were a uh, representative at the very important dialogue uh, on Asian civilizations, which had been called by President Xi Jinping uh, with representatives from all over the world. Uh, it was an idea, I think, that he had already in 2013 when he spoke at a security conference on Asia, that he wanted a conference of uh, a, uh, on Asian civilizations and their importance. And it was only now that the first major conference was being held and you were a guest there. I'd like to give us uh, your impressions of the conference, uh, who attended, uh, were other uh, Western representatives there, and where do they want to go from here? Well, <clears throat> this was uh, a truly remarkable <clears throat> conference, and I think what became very clear is that uh, what started also with the Belt and Road Initiative and the Belt and Road Forum number one and two, um, the first one I had attended two years ago, that Xi Jinping is creating a completely new paradigm of international relations. And this time, the focus was on Asian civilizations. And it was mostly Asian, some heads of state, many other leading uh, institutional people. There were also some Europeans, like the president of Greece, for example. But the main focus was Asia, Asian civilization. And uh, what came across is that the Asians right now are very proud. Um, there were many presentations focusing on the fact that many of the gradles of civilization were in Asia, uh, in China, in India, in other <clears throat> Asian uh, great civilizations, and that people are very proud and, uh, you know, also, you know, showed the beauty of their culture, the optimism, the future orientation. And in the two days conference, uh, there was not one speaker from Asia who would have any <clears throat> uh, negative or dark note. Everybody was absolutely uh, practicing the principle of relating to the best tradition of the other, of pointing to the fact that, you know, there is no conflict which cannot be solved through dialogue instead of confrontation. And I think that this is an extremely promising road for the future of international relations. And I'm pretty sure, even so, it was not mentioned explicitly that more such conferences uh, will follow involving <clears throat> other continents like Europe, like Africa, uh, hopefully the Americas. So I think this was really a very exciting, uh, exciting um, event. And, uh, you know, there was a cultural event, the uh, Asian Dialogue Civilization Carnival, which was truly impressive. You know, they had artistic presentations from all these different uh, Asian countries. And probably on the stage where I would guess 20,000 people and the choreography was so well tuned and it was so well done uh, that you know anybody could really see that uh, in Asia there's optimism. The Asians think that their their century is is on the rise, and it's not just China rising. It's uh, it's really the entire Asian continent. And you know, coming from Europe, I must say I cannot <clears throat> I cannot uh, emphasize more the absolute difference between the positive attitude, the optimism for the future, which you find in Asia. And if you look at the dilemma uh, <clears throat> of uh, the European Union, for example, or you know, even the mood of the population in the United States, which is very, very far from having this kind of optimistic outlook to the future. So I think the West would do better to, to learn a couple of things because Asia is doing something right. And I think there are carrying out values and virtues which we used to have, but where the West really got away from. And we are really looking at the, at the you know, consequences of, of that uh, going away from our best traditions. Really uh, contrasts starkly with the situation you have in U.S.-China relations, uh, where this whole trade dispute 
has unfortunately been escalated over the last few days, creating tremendous amount of tension. So you have the, uh, the Asian uh, collaboration, the Asian dialogue, and what you have on the Western side is uh, the dispute over trade. Uh, did this cast a shadow over the conference, and how did people react to that? And what is the impression now among uh, Chinese with regard to the possibilities of creating a working relationship with the United States now? Well, I don't think the conference as such was so much affected, but, you know, naturally uh, in private discussions and in some other meetings I had, I was really quite amazed because what had started a couple of months ago, like uh, trade tariff quarrels, you know, where Trump had said that he wanted to have uh, make America great again, establish tariffs. And some people thought these were protectionist tariffs, but I think it was clear to anybody uh, who understands what is really going on, that these were never Hamiltonian uh, kind of politics, but that, you know, Trump may have intended one thing, but given the fact that he is in a very complex administration and the <clears throat> security forces in the United States in the meantime have decided to declare China uh, an enemy, an adversary, a rival, a competitor, or a combination of all of the above. Uh, this thing has escalated. And while the trade negotiations in the beginning uh, looked like a solution would be possible, at least this was expressed both by the Chinese and also by, by President Trump, this thing is going completely out of control. And when the trade talks uh, failed, because apparently Lighthizer, uh, maybe others put in some unacceptable conditions for the Chinese, which basically would have meant that they would have abandoned their entire uh, model of success, uh, which naturally was completely unacceptable. It became very clear that the real issue here is not uh, protection of, of jobs in the United States, that may be a sub feature for Trump, but what is really behind this uh, attack on Huawei uh, and on other <clears throat> uh, top level uh, technologies of China uh, is the effort to contain China, uh, to prevent its rise, to uh, you know, make sure that China will, will never bypass the United States. And I think this is a, first of all, futile effort and, and secondly, very dangerous because First of all, you cannot contain uh, a, a, a people of 1.4 billion people whose government has set the policy obviously in the right direction. Otherwise, you would not have the tremendous success of the 40 years of reform and opening up, whereby you know 800 million of, or so people were lifted out of poverty. And now, uh, you know, the Chinese model is being uh, looked at as a way for the developing countries to overcome their own underdevelopment and therefore the Belt and Road Forum, you know, showed an alliance or rather a partnership of 150 nations and international organizations who are all committed to the new Silk Road spirit. And, you know, also China, as well as many of the other Asian countries, they have a 5,000 year history. They, China, for example, is very proud that they invented many, many things, you know, from gunpowder to porcelain to silk to, you know, many other book printing long, long before the West uh, discovered that. So the idea that you can contain a nation just because it's not Western uh, <clears throat> is a completely absurd idea and shows you just the stupidity of those people who are pushing now the clash of civilization of Samuel Huntington. Many years ago when Huntington wrote this book, uh, I tortured myself to read it. And I came to the conclusion that Samuel Huntington has no idea of any of the civilizations he was talking about, not of Christianity, not of Islam, not of Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism. He just is a very superficial a geopolitician who tries to play on these differences. And I think it was noted by many scholars and also the Chinese media that this uh, woman in the State Department, Karen Skinner, who made this unbelievable racist uh, comment that with China, the, the West and the United States is 
confronting for the first time a non-Caucasian uh, <clears throat> uh, culture or civilization. This was noted uh, very uh, negatively that this is an effort to, to go back to the confrontation of, of Samuel Huntington and the clash of civilization. So what you have right now is two completely opposing and competing models of international politics. One is the dialogue of civilization, which is very attractive because you know it brings benefit to all participating nations. And then you have the effort to maintain an unipolar <coughs> world order uh, based on the Anglo-American uh, alliance de facto, bullying countries, and this does not come across very well. And, and the reaction to the Huawei fight shows 170 nations are cooperating with Huawei because it's the better technology. Uh, and I think this is really something which, which should be reversed because it can only lead to a dangerous development for the entire world economy including that there was talk about a complete decoupling between the US and Chinese economy, the return to a Cold War where two completely different economic blocks would form. And this would be a catastrophe for the world economy because the West is not in a condition uh, to maintain that. But obviously for China and everybody else, it would be also very traumatic. It seems uh, talking about the Huawei situation, it seems that this is much more serious than simply the trade dispute uh, because it attacks uh, the very basis of China's development, making having made a headway in terms of uh, some of the most advanced technologies in telecommunications now. Uh, by attacking it, of course, it is attacking the, the very existential basis on which China has developed. So trade, of course, can uh, is a problem, but this is, is an ex existential threat. And it seems to me that if they move forward uh, on this in trying to cut off Huawei, which they generally may not succeed with because it has already come so far in terms of its relationship, but a continuation of that attack would, I think, uh, in damage seriously for the long-term U.S.-China relations. Now, President Trump has made an indication uh, that uh, this could be a part of the trade negotiations. That is, that the attacks on Huawei could be a part of uh, negotiating where the Chinese can continue developing in that direction. But what you're getting out of the State Department and out of the neocons is that Huawei has got to be taken out of the way because they cannot allow any other country to be a top dog in any technological field. And of course, not only is that attack on China, but on every other country uh, which uh, wants to develop and wants to become uh, the most important country in one or other field, which is the right of every nation. So how do you see that this, uh, if this doesn't change, if this isn't shifted, how is this going to affect U.S.-China relationships in the long term? Well, I think you know, there are many voices who, who uh, express concern. One of them was uh, the Malaysian Prime Minister Mahathir, who just attended a co conference in Tokyo, uh, the future of Asia, uh, where he said, you know, that if I'm not uh, quoting somebody in the US, obviously, if I'm not uh, on top, uh, <clears throat> I send the ships uh, warships, and this is not uh, negotiation and not competition. This is uh, you know, potentially leading to military conflict. And you know, I think that you know, this, there is no peaceful way. I mean, there are 16 cases in history where the second country bypassed the so far dominant country. Um, 12 times it led to war, four times it was a peaceful takeover of the second country, but it should be clear to anybody that in the age of thermonuclear weapons, a conflict between the two largest economy, economies and you know China having not only a sizable uh, nuclear force uh, itself, but is also strategically extremely closely allied with Russia, uh, which has made uh, significant breakthroughs uh, in, in the military technology. I mean, this can only lead to the total catastrophe for all of mankind. And I think we need a course of uh, people, institutions, countries who would all say, 
while China has made the offer to the West and to the United States repeatedly to join the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, to have multilateral and bilateral cooperation between China and the United States, but also joint ventures in, in uh, Latin America, in Af Africa, in Asia, in Europe, and that you know the United States should accept this and seize the enormous economic potential which the Belt and Road Initiative represents for, for all of mankind. And I'm <clears throat> right now, you know, trying to, to get the idea around that the more leaders do what the president of Panama uh, did, who said, yes, Panama wants to cooperate with the Belt and Road Initiative, but absolutely including the United States. And something similar was just said by the uh, president of Cambodia uh, <clears throat> and you know, also saying, you know, that Cambodia is absolutely working with China, but, you know, the U.S. Uh, policy of the Indo-Pacific should not be opposed to the Belt and Road Initiative, but should be integrated and there should be a joint development. So I think the more leaders from developing countries, from Europe, from other peace-loving people around the world who, who understand that this conflict should absolutely be de-escalated, the more of them would say, we work with China and the Belt and Road Initiative, but we emphatically invite the United States to be part of it, to overcome this geopolitical thinking, the zero sum uh, game thinking that if one wins, the other one has to lose and go to a completely different paradigm, namely that there is a win-win possibility if you make the cake bigger, if you focus on the <clears throat> joint you know, programs for the future that everybody can win. And I think between now and the G20 summit end of this month or end of next month, actually, you know, the more people join in and, and demand that the United States become part of this Belt and Road Initiative, I think the better. Because I think President Trump still talks about Xi Jinping as his good friend and he does have a positive image of China, which he expressed many times. So I think if we get to the G20 uh, summit, where hopefully there will be also a summit between President Trump and President Xi Jinping, and maybe also Putin, that if we you know, have a mobilization of the whole world population to say, we must have a new paradigm of international relations, there is actually the chance to overcome this geopolitical outlook. It seems uh, signals from both sides indicate that there will be a meeting uh, between President Trump and President Xi at the Osaka meeting. Uh, the question is, what, what do you think that President Xi uh, can, can do, uh, can offer to President Trump uh, in consistent with maintaining uh, the dignity of China uh, to try and get him off of this path uh, of moving on a trade war. What proposal do you think he could make that maybe would uh, win the president over to another direction in policy towards China? Well, if you look at the situation of President Trump, <clears throat> and we should talk about that a little bit later, you're inside the United States, he is quite stuck. On the one side, the Mueller report produced no evidence for any collusion with Russia, but that does not prevent Mueller from keep keep at it and you know even calling more or less on the democrats to go for impeachment uh, then the democrats uh, <clears throat> joining in in that obviously if you have that going on then the possibility to have a joint infrastructure program for the united states uh, the chances to get any kind of financing for it is is really looking almost non-existent so china could really show and president xi jinping could really show uh, you know, what the world could look like in a few years from now if there would be a joint uh, cooperation. There's even a new study from some British institution which says that the annual increase in production uh, will be uh, 7 trillion, uh, even if the United States does not join and the economic benefits for the United States just coming from this increased trade around the world uh, are overwhelming. So I think all the more this would be the case if you had a positive attitude and American corporations uh, <clears throat> could join and, you know, this could also lead 
to the US recovering because they don't have a full global industrial chain anymore because of many years of outsourcing and uh, destruction of the middle level industry. So the United States needs really a change in the direction what Trump wants, but you know, I think China could give a helping hand because of the <clears throat> internal mess uh, which exists in the United States. And I'm confident, I'm pretty sure that um, uh, Chinese scholars are working around the clock to come up with solutions to overcome that because it's very clear that China does not want to have this trade war because it, it, it has a tremendous risk for not only China, but for the whole world economy. So I think, you know, the more people demand uh, that the United States should should cooperate, uh, especially in the development of Latin America, of you know Africa, of the reconstruction of the Middle East, uh, the better it is. So the support uh, coming uh, for the Belt and Road from Latin America, and most recently, of course, uh, the Mexican president has indicated. Uh, a positive attitude towards it, but they are really under a lot of pressure. Seems like the United States is uh, is reviving the old Teddy Roosevelt policy of uh, using the club on the Latin American nations to prevent, uh, this case, uh, development in Latin America. How do you see the situation moving in that, uh, that uh, region of the world? Well, you know, you had uh, all kinds of uh, <clears throat> representatives of the U.S. administration, such as Pence, Pompeo, Bolton, who basically told the Latin American countries very explicitly that they should not uh, cooperate with China. Uh, you know, they, they quote the Monroe Doctrine, but what they really refer is the Roosevelt Corollary. And I think it's very important that people uh, study the difference because one was the policy of John Quincy Adams of a alliance uh, of perfectly re sovereign republics and the other one is an imperial uh, policy of Teddy Roosevelt. So people, you know, mix that up many times. But in that context, I think it is a tremendous opportunity and chance that the foreign minister uh, of Mexico, Ebrach, was just in Washington and he met with uh, John Sullivan, the Deputy Secretary of State, Jared Kushner, and the Home uh, Security Secretary. And he repeated what uh, President Obrador had already proposed uh, several times, namely that the United States join in a large investment program, especially in the south of Mexico, in Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, uh, bringing in trains, uh, developed ports, uh, electricity grids, pipelines, industrial parks, agriculture, so that basically uh, economic development uh, would be created. And actually, the uh, uh, Mexican foreign minister spoke about a Marshall Plan for that region, uh, because that way you would create an incentive for the immigrants who are now trying to get desperately over the border to the United States to instead stay in the countries where they are coming from and that this is actually the only way to stop the migration crisis for the United States. So I think if uh, President Trump would respond to this positively, you know, Ebrah was uh, talking about uh, 20,000 a billion investment from Mexico, another 20 billion from the Central American countries, and then uh, requiring 5.6 billion from the side of the United States, which Trump already had talked about and sort of promised in last December. So I think this would be a very good step in the right direction. It would be in the direction of the cooperation, which my uh, husband, Lyndon LaRouge, had proposed uh, almost 30 years ago in collaboration with President Lopez Portillo, the famous Operation Juarez Economic Development Program for Latin America. And it would be a first step in the direction of the United States cooperating uh, with the Belt and Road Initiative idea. So I think this should be absolutely supported. And, you know, I mean, to bring development to these poor countries uh, <clears throat> is the only way how you stop the, the migration question uh, in the human way. 
This would also be going back to the type of Alliance for Progress uh, program that President Kennedy had when we had much better relations with these Latin American countries. Let me shift over to Europe uh, now, Helga, with regard to uh, the support that's been coming uh, to the Belt and Road Initiative from a lot of the European countries, most specifically uh, spearheaded by uh, the Italian government. You've also had these European elections, and we're getting uh, different interpretations of that depending on your point of view. Uh, the one people, say, people saying on the one side that uh, the, the new parties in Europe, uh, the parties that have been revolt in revolt against the uh, business as usual uh, of the EU, have uh, moved ahead. On the other hand, people are saying that the center uh, liberal uh, coalitions have uh, maintained their power. What is the situation most specifically? Uh, what is the effect of these elections on the Belt and Road Initiative and the European support uh, for that initiative? Well, I think the Belt and Road Initiative uh, is supported uh, by most European countries, 22 of 28 uh, cooperate, the East and, West, uh, East and Central European countries, Italy, Portugal, Spain, Switzerland, Austria. So that is actually moving forward. Um, the anti-EU parties have won, not a sweep as it was expected, but they are definitely rising. The Brexit party in Great Britain got some something like 38 percent and the Tories collapsed to seven percent now that is uh, quite quite telling uh, also Le Pen won more than Macron in France but the real disastrous situation uh, happened in Germany and I'm really uh, I must say this is a, an example of meddling in the internal affairs of a country if I ever have seen one now, what happened was that you had this whole buildup uh, <clears throat> of the Greta Thunberg uh, campaign, you know, and for a 16-year girl to be invited to the uh, <clears throat> to the climate conference in in uh, I think it was somewhere in Poland, um, then um, the Davos conference she addressed, then she went to the, to Rome, she addressed. There, I think, a big rally in front of the parliament. The Pope met her, met her. then she went to Great Britain. She met the Queen. Um, so she got a play up, uh, which is, uh, she was in Germany several times. So this led to the Friday for Future demonstrations, which you know led really to a, a hysteria among teenagers saying, oh, Greta Thunberg and Octavio Cortez, they all say the world ends in 12 years. Why should I? keep learning, you know, I have to, so it led to this whole hysteria. And unfortunately, you know, there are also studies out <clears throat> which uh, show that the excessive consumption of digital um, devices, you know, everything from smartphone, playstations, uh, laptops, uh, has severe neurological effects on the brains of the people who do that. And the young people are known to look into their smartphone more than they talk to their neighbor. So their judgment in terms of history, in terms of uh, natural science is, is very poorly developed. And that is without any question. So you have this, uh, you can almost say child abuse, you know, because if, if you hype people up in such a way, then you get these results. Now, there was a special operation just a couple of days before the election, a video repeat uh, appeared by a so-called uh, YouTube influencer called Rezo. And he uh, made a devastating attack on the uh, main parties. Um, you know, they completely, <clears throat> you know, did, did badly on every point. He, he really tore into it and then said, you have to vote for the only party which takes care of climate protection. And that for sure had an impact, especially on the young voters and uh, the first voters. So uh, the end result was that the Greens are now the second party in Germany, which means that Germany as an industrial nation is finished because if you implement the green policies, uh, you know, th that is completely incompatible with Germany as an industrial nation. So this is definitely a, a huge existential crisis. 
And for example, the Greens won nine out of the 10 major cities. They got something like 32% in Cologne, uh, 31 point something percent in Hamburg, in Munich, uh, <clears throat> in Frankfurt, uh, and similar results elsewhere. In Berlin, they got, the Greens got almost as much as the CDU and the SPD together. So it's really a landslide. And, you know, I, the reason why I'm saying this is uh, meddling is because, you know, if, if you think this was just uh, an individual a uh, young man who, who you know, attacked the, uh, the existing parties uh, on his own. Well, he was a youth or is a YouTube influencer. Now, uh, people know what that is. A YouTube influencer is somebody who normally uh, makes advertisement for lipstick or for some other cosmetic thing. And, you know, this is being financed by the firms which, which capitalize out of it. And there are, in the meantime, large PR firms which sponsor that. And in, in this case, it was a firm called Ströer, uh, which owns uh, T Online and, and similar things. So this was then played up uh, by all the mass media as if it would have been just this young man who finally uh, gave the bill to, to these parties. But the difference, I mean, I'm an influencer, you are an influencer, but the difference is uh, that nobody pays us to get this message out. And naturally, when you put in a political message and then you use an orchestration of the entire media uh, so that this was really a hype just, just shortly before the election, you get this kind of result. Now, I think this was a classical case of meddling because this kind of PR operation is not a German uh, thing. And, you know, it's not in any way uh, fair play and, and according to the rules of the election process. The consequence of this is really bad and I think that unfortunately I think that Germany will have to feel some of the economic consequences because they get back to reason. Now fortunately this is not the whole story. Um, there are now many people in the medium level industry who want to join the Belt and Road Initiative uh, the IFO Institute in, in uh, Munich just put out a statement that the cooperation with China is very advantageous for Bavaria. Uh, so it's not the end of the story, but I, I really think Europe is in absolutely critical condition. It's disunified. The North, South, East, West conflicts are severe. And I think the only thing which can unify Europe is the cooperation with the Belt and Road Initiative. And hopefully some people of influence uh, will get that idea that the consequences otherwise would be a Weimarization of the entire European continent. And hopefully reason can return maybe even until the G20 summit. Switching over now to uh, the situation uh, in the United States, uh, you no doubt saw that uh, Robert Mueller uh, made his swan song as he rides off in the distance yesterday, uh, but he couldn't help but leave a, a, a last bit of excrescence uh, to the Washington media in more or less uh, uh, throwing the whole issue of the so-called uh, collusion uh, into uh, the, the assembly of the U.S. Congress. So the drumbeat on this impeachment now is, uh, uh, is becoming uh, much greater. Uh, the more uh, 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 attuned people in the political uh, realm, including uh, Nancy Pelosi, in, really in, understands that this could be uh, the death knell for the Democratic Party, ruin any, any chances they may have of uh, the next uh, presidential election and probably uh, major losses in the, uh, in the House of Representatives. But it has created a situation in which nothing can really be done to deal with the economic situation we have in these United States. And President uh, Trump's attempt to uh, come to a compromise with the leaders of the Congress uh, on, the, um, uh, on the infrastructure question uh, has been uh, destroyed by the fact that this whole uh, impeachment uh, issue is now uh, becoming a major drumbeat among the Democrats. And given the situation now of the flooding uh, in the Mississippi River and the whole Midwest, uh, it's not a question simply of, man, of, of infrastructure investment. 
now it's uh, it's really a crisis situation of uh, of meeting uh, the total devastation of the uh, the infrastructure and saving people's lives but the government is in gridlock as a result of that how can we change this situation here and how how do you view the situation now with regard uh, to the U.S. economic uh, 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 direction? Well, I think that uh, the Democrats and the intelligence uh, service heads of the Obama administration, they are extremely panicked because after all, Trump gave the uh, order to Attorney General Barr to declassify all documents relating to the uh, meddling in the 2016 campaign. There was a very interesting program on Fox TV, the Hannity Show, where <clears throat> they basically discussed uh, that you know the U.S. intelligence uh, outsourced dirty operations of spying in the 2016 campaign to British intelligence, to the Australian intelligence, and that that all has to be investigated. And there was even a demand since Christopher Steele, who is at the center of this. Uh, operation refused to cooperate with Barr, he only wants to cooperate with Horowitz, that he should be extradited to the United States. So, you know, I think the climate is that these people who did the um, coup attempt against Trump, they are afraid that any such declassification and continuing investigation of the investigators will bring forth incredible things, criminal things, maybe, you know, things which they have to fear to go to jail. So I think the frenzy, especially also with 2020 um, approaching, uh, is just incredible. And I think that the United States, you know, I mean, there's really a crisis of a different kind. You mentioned the floods in the Midwest. I mean, this affects lots of agricultural products, uh, soybeans, uh, this affects world production corn. The United States produces a very large quantity of the world's corn, uh, and these regions have been flooded since uh, these states in the Midwest and, and also the South in the South have been flooded for months. So I think the only way to go about it would be, you know, to go on a bipartisan mobilization for the four laws which were defined by Lyndon LaRouche many years ago. Go for Klaus Stiegel go for a national bank, new credit institution, a crash program for the increase of the productivity of the economy as you know, it is possible now with the space program put on the agenda by, by President Trump. But the space program alone doesn't do it. You need the full package designed uh, by my husband, including a new Bretton Woods because a new financial crash is, is hanging over the air uh, over us you know, as a, as a Damocles word. So I think the population better starts to you know, get away from this partisan uh, <clears throat> approach because you know, when you only hack on the other to, to try to uh, you know, diminish their election chances and you forget the common good, uh, then you know, the common good suffers. And I think the United States is not in safe waters at all. And only the package of Lin Lyndon LaRouche's four laws and the cooperation with the Belt and Road Initiative uh, internationally, uh, where the United States would take a role in shaping the future, not just being part of it, but you know, go back to the American Revolution, go back to the ideas of Benjamin Franklin, of the founding fathers, of John Quincy Adams. I think there must be a national debate which goes a little bit deeper than the present hysteria uh, <clears throat> you know, orchestrated by the mass media. So I think you know there is uh, an absolute need to go to a higher paradigm of, of thinking. The ideal opportunity now with all the memorials that are being held uh, for Mr. LaRouche worldwide, just most recently I saw in Yemen, but also in Latin America, uh, there will be memorials here next month uh, in the United States, uh, reviving the tradition, the ideas, and the life of Mr. LaRouche can create a different atmosphere uh, in the United States in terms of uh, giving uh, the pathway for President Trump to move in that direction. I understand also, Helga, that uh, you're calling out for uh, uh, President Trump 
to exonerate Lyndon LaRouche uh, from uh, all those accusations that led to his imprisonment many years ago, which of course were involving the same people who have been after the President of the United States, including Robert Mueller uh, and, and other people. And if he would understand that, uh, of course, this would uh, change the entire situation. So I think the, the, the possibility of, uh, of moving in the direction of the four laws of Mr. LaRouche is much greater today because his tradition, his ideas will now be revived in a higher level uh, as a result of all the activity that's going on. Maybe you want to say something about that exoneration campaign. Yes, I, I want to say this uh, in conclusion that the most important thing you, our viewers and audience can actually do is to help in this exoneration campaign because there is no greater contradiction between the beauty and wealth of the ideas of Linda LaRouche and the picture which has been painted by this apparatus which is involved in the witch hunt against Trump and uh, ironically now also the Chinese say uh, here Trump is complaining about that behind Russia gate is a witch hunt but now the United States is committing a witch hunt against China with China being the victim. So you have three victims of a witch hunt, my husband, President Trump and China. And it comes from the same people. It comes from those people who absolutely want to suppress the idea of a new paradigm. And I have said it before, but let me restate it, that the exoneration of my husband is so important that people have an unrestricted, unprejudiced a view on the solutions he presents. And I'm absolutely convinced that the exoneration is almost the precondition for the United States to stop this policy of confrontation uh, <coughs> being you know, in, in cahoots with, with the British Empire. Because only if you shed that kind of geopolitical thinking and look at the solutions presented by, by Lyndon LaRouche, can there be a solution on a higher level? So I would urge you to uh, join in this mobilization and get in touch with us. You know, we are doing a lot of important things. And you know, I think that's the best thing you can do for yourself, your country, and all of humanity. OK, with that, Helga, I think we'll conclude the interview. Uh, thank you for taking your time uh, today to be with us, and hope to see you again soon. Till soon.